Is this your found jewelry? And you found some trash? Wow. There's lots of things to be found. Like electricity. Pretty exciting day. Welcome back to our home build. I would like to show you the electrical system, which we're about to have live for the house. The wires that are going in here are hot right now, and so we actually do have electricity. All we are missing right now is the meter that's gonna be posted right here, and I have to get that figured out because we have the T-pole that's powering the tiny lab where we live and my workshop, and so I'm trying to shuffle the power around. Normally, you would see this is where the power is coming in because you have a wire running overhead to the street, and having driven a tiny house on wheels around the country, I have learned to hate overhead power lines. They freak me out to no end. And so we've got a lot of trees on this property and we're also 250 feet from the road here. So it was a no brainer for me. I rent a four foot trenching machine uh, that's a ride on tractor kind of a thing. And we dug a four foot trench that was six inches wide all the way out to the street, 250 feet. The guys uh, came out and they ran the wire and I asked if it was easy to do. If you could teach more people how to put the pipe in the way you did, it would be awesome. Awesome. So I was glad to hear that, it, that I did it right. This might seem ugly to you, but consider bushes, trees. There's like a million ways to hide up cabinet like this. Also, it happens to match our house with this thermary siding. I'm really happy about that. And lastly, uh, you should see the size of the cabinet that the city wanted me to put in. It was a, what's called a CT cabinet. And it was, I swear, twice as deep as this. And it was basically this entire size was just for two current transformers because we had, uh, we're ready for 400 amps of service to come in here. We were able to downgrade. This is a 300 amp cabinet actually. And so we've got right here, 150 amp, 150 amp fuses that we uh, have access to. So we've got the ability down the road if we ever needed it, which we won't, for 400 amps. And what that means is you're gonna run 400 amps of stuff at the same time. That's called your load, your design load. We do not need that because this house, although it does have some pretty interesting, sophisticated, um, very complex systems, of layered equipment. Like for example, we have five water heaters that all run all electricity. The biggest one is 120 amps by itself. But that would be if we're running the washing machine, the bathtub and the shower at the same time and washing our hands with hot water. That's dumb. We're not gonna do that because we know how to operate this house. Just in case though, they know that they want it to run that much water at a time. So we'll, we'll talk about that later. But Essentially here, we have 300 amps, which is more than we're gonna need because there's only four of us living here, two grown-ups, two kids, two cats. Cats don't use electricity. We're gonna be fine. Just in case this ever turns into a compound where we're gonna be doing welding and ceramic work and have a kiln and be uh, having Thanksgiving day where everybody's taking showers and cooking at the same time, then we're ready for that. Uh, so the big wire that comes in here is offering 300 amps. We're gonna have a 320 amp meter. Don't ask me why that's the case, but we were able to basically get everything into one cabinet here, which I thought was a much more nicer way to do it. So come on inside, let me show you around what's going on in there because building a house that's high performance and trying to have the electrical system match and tune with all the other systems is actually a thing that is kind of difficult to do. So let me show you. So you'll see as we go inside, we've got these wires that are just left outside. Sometimes they're pigtailed. Um, to look a little nicer, but these are where we're gonna attach, first of all, a light, obviously, here, and a uh, outdoor outlet. You're gonna need an outdoor outlet every time you've got a door that's going outside and it needs to be within a certain amount of space. That one we can hide behind a shrub or whatever. This is our front porch. This is our step that is not gonna be here in the final analysis, but um, where to put these is an important decision. And if you're not there, or if you don't say exactly where this goes, then the electrician is gonna have to just make something up and it might be not where you want. And for us, when you're worried about drilling holes, like for example, this siding, not really easy to patch. Uh, this is the Ignite Thermary siding and I, I wanna make one hole and then I wanna cover it with the housing for the light. So they had to drill this hole. Now, obviously they're drilling these holes after we have already installed the sheathing and air sealed it and tested to prove in that the house is super airtight. 
then insulated the outside, put on a rain screen, and put on the siding. So they drilled that hole. Now I have no air tightness layer anymore. So come on, let me show you how this works. So when you come inside, you'll see that here, watch out for the crawl space access. This is the hole that they made. Put the outlet outside. Now I can't seal it just at the, the siding outside because I've got a rain screen behind that. I've got all kinds of ways for air to get past that exterior seal and get to the inside or vice versa. And this is not just about energy efficiency. Remember, this is about condensation. This is about air quality problems, contaminants, bugs. All kinds of stuff happens when you have air leakage. This happens to be my sheathing. So if I could sh seal it right on the other side of this piece of uh, paneling, that would be best case. That would have been like original air sealing. But of course, you can't do that all the time. So since this thing itself is substantially airtight, and if you want to know what substantial means, you can check out the home chem playlist. Uh, it turns out that nothing really in a house is truly airtight, but that's okay. This does a pretty good job of air sealing. Uh, air sealing. I'm going to have to seal this up with tape, and I've got all kinds of different tapes from 475 High Performance Building Supply, which I'm using for this. So this gets sealed right here on the inside face of this. I would want to make sure that I did not insulate before I thought of this. So immediately after the electricians are here, I go ahead and seal up all the penetrations that have now been created. Let me show you the studio. This is something that we're pretty proud of. This room now has been insulated because we passed our electrical inspection. As I said, the power is live. And so first thing you'll notice in here is that we've got our two electrical panels with 300 amps of service. You've got quite a lot of different things that we need to power. What's cool here is the electricians were able to do kind of an organized system. You can see how many wires are going in at the bottom. This side happens to have thicker wires than this side. This is all the little stuff for the house. And this is all big stuff like HVAC equipment, the water heaters, the workshop sub panel. The tiny lab uh, will be powered off of this side. So this will make sense. Um, to be able to work with later. I had thought that I wanted to install these in like a closet. This happens to be a wall where we're going to install more of that Thermary Ignite uh, siding, which I'm pretty excited about. This is going to be like a really beautiful black wall. And we've got these like not very beautiful panels in it. We're going to figure that out and kind of you work with cabinet doors basically, uh, custom made. So I wanted to put these inside the water, um, the washing machine closet, but you can't put these in a closet. There are all kinds of code rules about where you put these things. So anyway, we had to deal with that. Um, you can see that there are outlets in exterior walls. I knew I was not going to be able to do a perfect job of that. Um, but essentially, we're trying to avoid putting outlets or anything that's going to interrupt the insulation in exterior walls. And this wall is one of those two by six walls. So we've got two by four of insulation because I've got some two by four walls to some two by six walls. If you want to know more about why we did that, go way back in time to the design uh, webinars that we did. But this allows me to have a two inch cavity here so that I can put things like two inch deep electrical boxes. Now this is another 475 high performance building supply um, product. It's like a uh, sheath that you're supposed to put your electrical box inside of. It didn't really fit for some reason. The um, size of the boxes that they were putting in. I thought these were standard sizes. Maybe they're a little deeper than normal. Anyway, the guys uh, did not do it the way that it's really supposed to be done. They were a fantastic crew, and I'll show you specifically why they were so excellent in a minute. But really, these wires should have penetrated. They should have made a hole and gone through the outside of this. You can see here that they just put this behind the entire thing and then fasten it in place. What this is for is to tape my Intello interior house wrap two because taping it to this when this is not an airtight box is not going to be good enough for the levels of airtightness that we're looking for. And again, condensation, bugs, stuff like that. You can also see that we've got switch boxes here and this is a nice organized way to run these uh, wires. They all need to be back a certain amount of space because I, <laughs> I guess it's like a natural assumption for building professionals and for the code people that like a homeowner is only going to use a nail or a screw of a certain length when they're trying to hang pictures later. And they think that if they put it uh, two inches back or whatever from the face of the stud, then they're safe. And I, having been a homeowner before who was not in the building industry, I know for a fact that homeowners will use whatever they find in their drawer or their catch-all drawers. Like if the screw is that long, that's what's going on the wall. So 
I don't think that's a safe assumption, but it's fine. We're gonna live here. I know what my house is like now. Essentially in this room, we've got a whole bunch of stuff in the ceiling. You can see we've got fans, we've got the, the hanging lights that are gonna be up there. In some cases, they have to. You can see that wire, that's the bundle of wires that's going sideways through all of those joists. Sometimes you cannot avoid doing that. To take that set of wires and go all the way down the roof cavity and then come all the way down the wall and then jute all the way across the crawl space and then all the way up into the walls is just totally impractical. It's gonna use a lot more wire, it's gonna take a lot more time and it's gonna, how much is it really gonna save you? However, you do wanna try and avoid that wherever possible and I will show you right now where this becomes an issue, come with me. These are extension cords. They are not part of the permanent electrical system, so totally disregard these. But what we have here is a completely naked wall with no electric in it now, although that's not always the case. When we first came in after the electricians and there were four or five guys working for multiple days and we came in and kind of checked, but after one particular day, they had wired up a significant amount of the house and I saw that they had drilled holes in every single one of these studs and even this post so that they could run a wire from that outlet right there to that outlet down there. And I have a crawl space that's four feet tall that is explicitly for all of the services in this house, the electrical, the plumbing, the drain lines, the HVAC system. And I tried to make that very clear to my contractor by talking to this project supervisor and the owner of the company in the, in the tour and said, you know, if at all possible, let's try and use this crawl space. That got lost in translation or it kind of faded into the background and they went ahead with what they normally do, which is this. They do this for a couple different reasons. Number one, nobody gives them any pushback about it normally because the person who's gonna suffer in this case is the insulator, which is now me and my family. And it makes it really hard to do the insulation right when there's wires right in the middle of my wall cavity. Second thing is that uh, when we have two guys, one up here and one down there, drilling holes and passing wires to each other, that's twice as many people as is necessary as if you're gonna do it this way. They can have one guy run this entire line by himself. And that was how they were working. And so when we came in here that night, I was kind of just dejected and said, well, I guess this is just how building works. And I, I tried to make it different, but this is what we got. Um, and Grace wasn't having it. So she gave me a pep talk and I went to sleep and I woke up with motivated uh, sense of purpose and came in here and, and pulled the project manager aside and said, look, this is not okay. We got to do this again. And they said, hey, no problem. We want you to be happy. And they literally re-ran all these wires in the house, even the ones on interior walls. They went ahead and went down into the crawl space. Generally, you need to remember, if you're a civilian and not a building professional, building professionals want you to be happy. I am paying my contractors enough that they don't have to worry about nickel and diming me. They don't feel afraid that I'm not gonna pay them or something like that. So when I ask for something specific, this is the business model. It's just like any service industry. You go to a hotel that's a nice hotel, they're like, oh, absolutely, we'll bring you a, a toothpaste and toothbrush set or we'll give you a new pillow or we'll change your room if you don't like the way your room smells. That's a good hotel. You stay in a crappy place and they're gonna give you a hard time. Don't pick crappy contractors is the answer if you're like, well, my contractor would never do that. Or if you're a contractor right now and you're saying, I would never put up with a client like you. You have the wrong clients. You should get people who are paying you and giving you enough time to do the job right. So they took all this out, they re-ran the wiring down through the floor, and now I have a beautiful place to be able to put nice insulation that's perfectly installed and then put my interior house wrap that's the Intello. These two by four walls, we always tried to keep everything out of. In fact, upstairs, you'll see, we even went with floor outlets instead of wall outlets just so that we could achieve that. Let me show you the living room. You can see some of the electrical details of our system in the filming of the upcoming season of Home Diagnosis, our television series. There are definitely struggles with geometry that you need to consider carefully, aside from just where to put lights. You need to look at things like fans 
and hanging lights being in close proximity with each other. In the ceiling of our kitchen here, you can see that we've got some really close together stuff. This right here is a uh, puck light that's basically like a recessed fixture. This is going to be a hanging chandelier that comes all the way down to basically where my head is. And this right here is a ceiling fan that is five feet uh, or five and a half feet. I can't remember which exactly. It might be even six feet wide. So we need to make sure that the blades of the ceiling fan aren't going to, number one, cut the wires that are suspending these fixtures like the chandelier or right over here, three feet away also an island pendant. And so I've got six inches of clearance both ways. And for that, I used my three-dimensional laser projection system. It uh, gives you three planes at once. That's really useful if you want to know exactly where on the floor each of these things is going to be. So this has come in very handy for all of that stuff. But the second thing that's also important is if my fan is running in low mode, I don't want to have a light source behind it that's going to be casting a shadow of the blades of the fan on the floor. So all this stuff has nothing to do with electricity, but it's very dependent on your experience of the electrical systems later on. You can see all the details about our lighting system in a very uh, intense half hour interview that we did with Kitchler Lighting's Jeff Dross. So that's how our lighting system was designed. But of course, we have been closely involved in the actual on-site implementation of all that because just having a piece of paper is one thing, putting it into practice, totally different. So aside from the air tightness levels, aside from all the appliance, configurations and stuff like that, which you'll see as we keep on continuing through the install, we'll bring you the stuff about the appliances that we're using that are all very energy efficient and very, very cool. The heating and cooling systems and all of the gizmos that are going to go into the control systems for this house. Please do make sure you subscribe for all that, by the way. Um, please make sure that you comment if you have anything to add about doing high performance homes and how you want to specifically tune the electrical system for that. And also like this video if you can. If you want to support our work, go over to patreon.com slash home diagnosis TV. And that's where uh, our members get behind the scenes access to all of the stuff that we're doing day by day. Thanks very much. Tune in next time.